Thank you. Uh, Mike, I think you wanted to start with uh, just an introduction on Bitcoin Beach, right? Yeah, I, I really hope uh, that it's not just Bitcoiners here today. I hope there's a lot of uh, Bitcoin hesitants out there in the audience because it's just exciting to have to bring these two groups of people together and with so many similarities, with so many similar views, and that both see the need for a money that, that governments can't control. And so I, I'll be available afterwards. I would love to take people's questions and I would love to... Um, yeah, hear what your hesitations are, or if you're very anti-Bitcoin, please come up afterwards and we'd love to talk. I think the first thing I'd like to address is the fact that we're talking about Bitcoin Beach in El Salvador, and obviously looking at the three of us, probably none of us were born in El Salvador. Um, I feel a little bit Salvadoran because my kids have grown up there and my daughter had a quinceanera last year, and so I know the pain of people growing up in Latin America and why they don't have any money <laughs> because uh, I, I did not realize what I was getting into. But it's sad for me that, that Jorge Valenzuela, who's really been the, the leader and the, the muscle and the one who's all made this work, was not able to join us today. And he wasn't able to join us because he couldn't get a visa, because we still live in a world where there's arbitrary borders, and there's not the ability for people to travel freely. And people like myself that happen to be born in a country where my passport gets me into more places, I have the freedom to be here. And so I have the freedom to, to represent what's happening in El Salvador here, and I, I feel that that's an honor. But I also think that it really shows us the importance of Bitcoin because we see the same, the same limitations put on people when it comes to money. It's very challenging for money to move around in this world. It's still very segmented. We still live in countries with walled gardens. And so for Salvadorans, they don't have a lot of the tools that we have. There, you cannot use Venmo there. You cannot use Cash App there. You cannot make easy transfers because a lot of it just has to do with the economics of it. It's not worthwhile for these companies to go in to these smaller populations and have to comply with the AML and the KYC regulations that the US government pushes on them. And so if you guys don't remember anything else from, from this weekend or from this week here, I hope you realize that AML and KYC, they really are human rights issues because they are what keep those on the bottom rung of the economic ladder from having financial services. And it's not a lot of times that the banks don't want to, to deal with these people that are, that are poor, but it's just not, they can't afford to. All these regulations that are pushed on them, all these hoops they have to jump through, mean that every one of them is an expense. And if they can't make a certain amount of money off them, they're not going to support them. And so I think it's very important as we hear the government talk about the challenge, the, the, how scary it is with Bitcoin that they, we don't know who's sending money to where and we can't control it, we don't know who they are, that what they're really saying is, we're taking control away from them and we're not letting them restrict certain people from using that system. One of the, the things I've seen in my years in El Salvador, we, we bought a home there 17 years ago and we've lived there for the last eight years, was just the, the heartbreaking cycle of, of immigration in a country that really can't provide uh, enough jobs for its population and the impact that those restrictive trade and, and flow of money issues have on causing those challenges. And when you get into a place like El Salvador has this kind of continued destructive cycle of the parents leave because they can't find good paying jobs in El Salvador, the kids grow up without the parents and so they're more likely to join the gangs. Because of the gangs, businesses flee and there's not good jobs and you start this cycle over and over again. And so we're seeing for the first time in El Salvador this technology come in and kind of break that chain. It's giving people the chance to work for companies all over the world. They can still live in the country where they were born, where their family members are, but earn a better wage. They can open businesses and, and interact with companies and other customers around the world because they're not restricted by the, the banking laws. And we're seeing just kind of a renewed hope 
And so anybody who, who is in the, the human rights space knows just how crucial it is to have a hope. Just so many people, when they're, when they're beaten down, when they believe that, that there's nowhere, that there's no way that they can win, that's when they give up. But if they just have this sliver of hope that there's a, a better tomorrow, it really gets them pushing forward. And they do things that nobody thinks that they're able to. And we're not that, that Bitcoin's not a magic bullet. And I'm always very careful to tell people, Bitcoinization is not our goal. We just see Bitcoin as a tool. It's not the end goal. But it does provide this very important tool that, that leads towards families being able to, to grow up together, to not have to grow up far from their kids, to be able to, to build a society that can build a better future. And so uh, we're very thankful to be a part of that and, and to be here with you guys today. Yeah, Mike, so you mentioned hope. Um, you've been in El Zonto for a long time. Maybe you can get a, uh, give a little bit of context about what kind of town El Zonto is and the projects that you and uh, Jorge and Roman, uh, who couldn't make it, started there, even before Bitcoin, uh, around the Hope House. So El Zonte, where, where we started the Bitcoin Beach project, it is a, a small coastal town. It kind of um, is mostly based on tourism, a, a little bit of fishing more historically, not much anymore, but it's really a, a small village that focuses on people coming from the weekend or, or even some foreign tourists. And then a lot of people have the traditional cornfields, what they call milpas and, and bean patches. And so it's a, a town where very few people go to university and most of the people there are living on three to $400 a month and kind of subsisting. And, and for the most part, um, I'd say the average education is probably about sixth grade. So when you hear people talk about, oh, Bitcoin can never work in these countries because the technology is too confusing and they can't handle it. I mean, we've seen firsthand, it's, it's literally the nine-year-olds you know, showing their mom how to use it. Um, I'm one of those typical middle-aged guys that can barely do my email. I mean, I, I still use Earthlink, if that tells you anything. It's... <laughs> So if, if I can do that along with, with a you know, group of hardworking but, but mostly uneducated people from the small village could embrace Bitcoin and use it in daily, our daily lives, that shows just how, how workable it really is. But, but even before Bitcoin, it was a community project for the kids there to give them a sense of community, yeah. right? Yeah, we've really been focused on, on gang prevention and just family unity. And so from the beginning, we're focused on education, getting people to university, um, doing different programs that provide mentorship for the young men and women whose parents are in the U.S. and have nobody investing in their lives. And so we'll do things like cleaning the, the local river and um, doing projects, repairs on, on homes of older people. And part of that is the benefit of the actual work, but a bigger part is just spending time with these young people and start to invest in their lives and ask what their dreams and hopes and what their plans are for the future. Yeah, or serving with them. Yeah, activities. definitely surfing. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, and at some point, Bitcoin became a part of this, became a part. How, how does it, what's the story there? So we were doing a number of these programs and, and working with some other nonprofits and one individual came to me and, and he knew that I was kind of interested in the Bitcoin space and he said, hey, we had somebody who's donated a Bitcoin to us, how can we use it? And so I, I helped him think through it a few different ways and didn't think anything else of it and about three months later he called me and said, hey, do you want to meet this, this donor that donated the Bitcoin. And of course, I was fascinated. I was just kind of curious as to what was motivating this individual. And so I went to this meeting, and it actually wasn't the, it wasn't the donor. It was an advisor. The, the donor really wanted to stay kind of behind the scenes, wanted the focus not to, to be on them, and wanted to remain anonymous, but really had this vision of Bitcoin being used for those on the bottom rung of the economic ladder not just the, the resources or the money value of the Bitcoin, but the technology that would bring this inclusion. And so they had gone to a number of nonprofits and said, hey, we, we would like to give a donation of Bitcoin to you, but we have this one stipulation that you can't just cash it out into dollars. You have to use it in real transactional ways. We want to see the Bitcoin kind of flow. 
And this was a challenge for most nonprofits. They just told me, hey, this, this isn't what we really do. And so we put together this crazy proposal to interject Bitcoin into all these different community programs that we were doing and, and provided it to the advisor and said, hey, this is what we think we can do. This is why we think it'll be so helpful in El Salvador. We see the, the issue with remittances and, and how much fees, as, as many of you know, it's always the poorest that, that pay the highest fees in the financial system. So we were seeing people just so much of their funds being siphoned off by fees during remittances, but also just seeing the, um, how many of the people in this, this small village felt cut off from the rest of the world and like as the world was progressing, they weren't going with it. And so we saw with Bitcoin, we could really plug them into that system and the opportunities it provided. Yeah, so you mentioned uh, one of the things was you do tasks with the kids or the kids, kids would get tasks, you know, cleaning up the river or these kinds of things, serving as lifeguards. And they would actually be paid in Bitcoin to do that. And then the other part of the project was to get the stores in town to accept Bitcoin, right? What were the challenges there? Was that easy? How did you do that? Getting the stores on, on board was initially very challenging. Fortunately, uh, Jorge Valenzuela, who was kind of the lead on that, his mom has one of the stores and the pupuserias, which the pupusas are the kind of traditional Salvadoran food. And so she owned this business and I think he basically told her, okay, you have to start accepting this. And so uh, once we had her accepting it and her neighbor started realizing, wow, she has so many more customers now. Uh, what's going on over there? How do we get in on this? And so in the initial stage, we had to kind of walk with these businesses and hold their hands and ask, you know, they had lots of questions about the volatility. How do they hold it? What backs Bitcoin? But we quickly found once they started using it, once they saw just all the opportunities it provided, um, they started coming to us and saying, hey, how can we onboard to this? Right, and that's how you sort of got a circular economy going a little bit. Yeah, right. that was how it initially started, and then it's, it, it wasn't uh, you know, a quick process. It was, you know, probably took us a month to get the second store and a few weeks to get the third, and it, it kind of gradually built up steam over time. Yeah, and, and Miles, I think you heard about this project, and you decided to travel down and see what's going on. Is that right? Yeah, so... For many years, I've been obsessed with understanding and, and observing how Bitcoin is being used around the world. So whether that's receiving a Bitcoin remittance in a pawn shop in Manila, or I went to the, the protests in Hong Kong to see how Bitcoin was being used there, or uh, um, the marketplace in Nigeria. I've always been obsessed with this. And so when I heard about what Mike was doing down there, I decided to shoot him a DM on Twitter and <laughs> about... We hopped on a quick call, and within 20 minutes, we had agreed that, like, all right, in two days, I'll fly down and, and stay at your family house. I think it's... Which my wife was like, what? You met somebody on Twitter, <laughs> and they're going to come stay with us? And um, when I got down there, I immediately fell in love with it. It felt like the most important uh, project in the world. And uh, two weeks quickly went by, and... Uh, it turned into many months uh, as I became really committed to seeing the success of this project. Uh, at that time, um, you could feel the momentum really starting to grow in the town and in the broader um, kind of global consciousness as well, because that was originally in October um, of 2020. But it was really what I found so interesting. And one of the, one of the reasons I was so keen to get down down there and see what was happening was because as we scaled Cash App from one million to tens and tens of millions of users, what we saw was that Venmo uh, had picked up all the, the, the rich tech people in San Francisco, New York, LA, but there was a big, big gap in underserved people around the country. Uh, oftentimes people without bank accounts where we were providing basic financial services for them um, and really uh, offering them a lifeline and basic economic empowerment. And so for me, the, the, the dream of early Bitcoiners was uh, oftentimes to get adoption going in the developing world, to get a country to embrace it, and to hear that there was a possibility of helping to build that culture there was super, super intriguing to me. It felt very aligned with the work that I'd previously been doing 
and um, I have a keen interest in Bitcoin education and understanding what we, what we need to do to onboard the next billion people around the world. And so this was direct hands-on experience with a community that already had great leaders, great momentum um, in a perfect seaside village uh, in El Salvador in the midst of COVID. So to me, it was a no-brainer. I bought a ticket, was down there two days later, and uh, decided I'd, I'd never wanted to come back. So what did you? What was the success? What did the success look like? What benefits did it bring to the local community there? What really struck out to me is that most people lived hand to mouth, where you spend what you earn uh, that week or that day, and once, like once this idea that your money could be stored digitally, that it had a possibility to go up, you could see the way it affected and changed people's mindset for the better their time preference of money would often change. Or I've been told this um, by many individuals in the town, but maybe I won't get that, those two pupusas and that Coke and save that $3, because maybe, maybe in a month or two from now, that $3 will be worth $6. You know, it's not a ton of money to people in this room probably, but a, a doubling of your income or the, or the money that you've saved is, just, is doubly as impactful to these people no matter where you are. So, it, Alongside that change in kind of like a time preference of money, I think it greatly expanded people's connection to the broader world, to feel connected to this global monetary system where all of a sudden they can receive funds from anyone, they can send funds to anybody. And maybe, maybe as an entrepreneur, you, you previously only had uh, hopes and dreams of starting a business within this small little village or maybe down in Tunco, right down the road. But now all of a sudden you're, you're, you're getting payments sometimes from, from people all around the world, and now all of a sudden you're dreaming bigger. Maybe you're dreaming of, of going out somewhere and then bringing back a, uh, a successful business or, or some sort of savings um, back, to, back to your local community to, to continue to grow it. So I think for the f there's billions of people around the world still without access to any sort of capital markets or savings, and introducing Bitcoin to that population has tremendous value to allow them to take part in the economic gains that we all um, so take for granted. Just to follow up on that, when, when we were initially given the, this opportunity to, to use this donation, I kind of saw it as, okay, I'm, I'm, I like Bitcoin, but in this use case, it's actually just gonna be more work. So it's going to be this extra step that we have to jump through, and, and it's going to be this extra hurdle. And I didn't realize at the time how important it was to actually be using Bitcoin. To, to have, like Miles was saying, we saw in the young people that we were working with this switch kind of flip, where before they were very consumer-focused of what they could buy that week or even that day, now they started saving money for the first time in their lives. And, and quite frankly, I didn't even know that that was possible for them because on the salaries that they were earning, I, it just seemed like, no, it makes sense that you're spending, spending everything that you make. But because they had this compelling way to save, they found a way to do it. They started working more. They started scrimping on, on what they were spending on and accumulating these assets that we've seen them start businesses, we've seen them buy cows, we've seen them, the one gentleman got all his teeth fixed, he was, he's in his 40s and had teeth problems his whole life and, and was able to save a couple thousand dollars to, to get his teeth fixed. And so we're seeing this total switch that not just has to, to do with how they see money, but also things like education. They have this time preference now for, okay, I'd rather sacrifice and continue going to school so I can get a better job that pays more, that I'm more excited about, and I'm willing to sacrifice the immediate wages that, that I could be earning. And so you see this kind of, in all the areas of, this life, of their lives, this kind of switch happen, and this excitement about the, the future. Like, they, they now believe in the Salvadoran dream. Like, there is gonna be a future in El Salvador not just to, to sneak into the U.S. or to join the gang, but to actually build a business and, and a life in El Zante or the other places in El Salvador. And so it's, it's been just fascinating and a real privilege to me to see this byproduct of actually using Bitcoin rather than dollars. 
How do the locals deal with the challenges of Bitcoin? The volatility would be the most obvious one. It goes up, sometimes it goes down. When it goes down, it might be a problem. How do locals deal with that? Is, is that a problem for them? Yeah, that's definitely a problem. And we've kind of walked with them from the beginning. Sometimes, you know, we've told them, hey, in the fir especially for the stores, in the first few months, if, if it really goes down, we're going to come and make you whole. We're not, we don't ever want you to be in a position where, you know, you're, you're uh, putting yourself in danger or putting things at risk. But we're also very clear with them, like, this can go up and down. So don't be speculating in it. We tell them the, the amount that you're saving in it, that should be your long-term savings. And so kind of helping them find that balance. But I think people really um, underestimate the intelligence and, and resilience of, of people that are living in poverty. Sometimes there's an assumption because people are poor that they're stupid. But that's really not the case. So if someone wants to replicate this model in another part of the world, what pointers would you have for them? What's the way to go? Do they need a rich, rich donor, do you think? Is this a necessity? Or how do you bootstrap something like this? I, I don't think you necessarily need a rich donor, but you do need people that are willing to invest in the community, um, specifically time-wise. Uh, this never would have worked if we would have just driven to some you know, random location and showed up and said, hey, we're going to introduce Bitcoin. This was because we'd been working in this community for years. But me, mostly behind the scenes, our local team, the ones that have grown up there, the ones that are interacting with these people daily. And so they had that trust with them. And so people were willing to kind of step out and, and take this risk and to check out this you know, magic internet money thing. And so I think definitely having donations and resources behind it is, is important. But more than that, having people that really their long-term goal is to see the benefit of the people, not just to get them a, to adopt Bitcoin. Because that's, Bitcoin's a tool. You can't, um, you can't, you know, it, if that is all your life is about, it's going to be pretty empty, in, in, my, in my opinion. And so I see Bitcoin as a tool for all the other great things in life. I, I echo Mike's uh, sentiment there that, like, a really strong community leader, someone that's respected um, throughout the whole region and uh, people can come to and they trust is an is a absolutely must-have. Um, Jorge, in particular, worked tirelessly on this and uh, was such an inspiration. I find myself really inspired by people that have reached out to me asking like, with such enthusiasm, how can we get th this going in other places, whether that's Santa Teresa, Costa Rica, Lake Atilan, um, or uh, all the way to Nigeria. People have been really inspired by this model. And I would just say that I don't think anything is 100% repl replicable. I think you're going to have to find your exact way to make it work. But uh, a prereq an absolute prerequisite is having community support, having a trusted leader, and, and really the commitment to be there and, and, and doing it for the right reasons, which Mike has stated throughout this presentation. Right. Uh, so right now, uh, it's going national, basically. The, the, the model is, in a way, being replicated not only in different parts of the world, but it's being replicated on a national level. But, you know, the Salvadoran government has made Bitcoin legal tender. Now, for me, there's a little bit of an odd discrepancy because, for me, uh, Bitcoin Beach is very inspirational and it's this you know, grassroots, bottom-up story. And now the government's coming in, in with more of a top-down approach. What are your thoughts on that? Do you have any thoughts on how it's being rolled out in the rest of El Salvador? I mean, I think it's always easy to, to, to second-guess the way something's happening. I mean, if I was in, in, in charge, which I'm definitely not and, and don't have any say, but if, if I probably, there's a lot of things that I would have probably done differently. But I think also um, we have to give the, the government credit for seeing that this is something that's going to benefit the people and is going to be an asset to the people and kind of taking that risk. Now, obviously, I think they have their own motivations. I think, you know, the first person to adopt Bitcoin is going to go down in the history books for that. I think they also saw, quite frankly, that there was a a number of large businesses that would be willing to come in and start providing jobs. And, and it really gave El Salvador the opportunity to change the narrative about El Salvador almost overnight. Instead of it being the land of, of gangs and murders, it became you know, the land of Bitcoin and surfing and pupusas. And so I think 
you know, there was a lot of self-interested reasons that, that the government adopted it. And I'm not naive to, to think that their reasonings are necessarily the same as ours, but I think longer run, a free money, regardless of uh, what the reasons they pushed that direction were, is going to benefit the everyday people. Miles? Yeah, I, I think it's really important to, to understand that 70% of Salvadorans don't have bank accounts. They have no financial infrastructure or tooling to manage their daily lives, to grow their lives, to make them more fruitful. And so having access to an open monetary standard is unquestionably a good thing for, uh, for them from my perspective. I mean, Bitcoin is an embodiment of human rights uh, from my perspective. It's crypt cryptographically guaranteed uh, equ equality of access and opportunity. It's the same rules applied indiscriminately to everybody. And so, yes, there's a Chivo wallet. Yes, uh, there's things that need to keep improving on it. From uh, that's offered, for, Chivo is offered uh, by the government, and they released it on a quick 90-day schedule. But no, every single Bitcoin app is valid there. Every every non-custodial uh, app is there, and I think credit should be given where credit is due. Just as Africa skipped the landline generation and went straight to mobile, and we've seen the incredible, uh, incredibly empowering effects. Um, that that's had. El Salvador skipping the, the kind of fiat bank, the analog banking system uh, entirely, where only 30% of people were, uh, were um, welcomed into that. Uh, rebuilding their financial infrastructure on uh, the Lightning Network, to me, is an incredible step, and one that, to me, signals economic empowerment, and one that everybody can enjoy uh, universally. Whoa. So from here, what are the longer term plans for Bitcoin Beach? For Bitcoin Beach, our longer term plans are to, to continue to focus on specifically the communities that, that we're already working in. Um, we do feel you know, some obligation to, to help with broader educational efforts, but really our focus is, is on the place where we live and, and those people. And so that's kind of what we're doing. But the great thing about Bitcoin is it's decentralized. And so there's all these other groups and people and businesses that have come in. A lot of them we don't even know. They don't need permission from us. It doesn't need to be directed by us. They can, they can lead their efforts in their town. We can be doing something over here. But the uh, overall, as it all comes together, it'll be transformative for, for the country. And so we're really focused on, we want to remain true to our roots and, and true to the community that we started with. Yeah, and I think one of the things you're already seeing is that El Zante in particular is becoming like a place of pilgrimage almost for Bitcoiners. And I think that was one of your original plans as well. Like you wanted to attract, you know, people to actually come to El Zante and spend Bitcoin and in that way, uh, you know, m make it more sustainable, m less uh, dependent on the donate donated money, right? Yeah, that was one of, with, with all development efforts, the, the goal, the long-term goal needs to be self-sustainability. And so that was our goal, was we want to attract the class of tourists who really, they, they want to come and just buy stuff. I mean, we see people come to El Zante and they're just so excited to spend their Bitcoin that they don't even really care what they're buying. They just love the, the, to be able to transact. And so um, our goal is that that, that benefits the, the local stores and that they would be able to have this kind of sustainability with that. Right. I think, Alex, do we have time for questions? Yeah, are there any questions? Does anyone have any questions? Uh, I have a comment instead of questions. I've been down there a few times to see Michael. I like to give credit where credit is due to guys like Michael, Alex, Miles, I'm sure you as well. You guys are doing an amazing job, and it's all from the right heart. So everybody follow the lead, take them as an example, and start your own project like him what they're doing with their foundation and everything. Hi, um, yeah, I have a question. What do you guys think would be, can be the next country that will follow El Salvador's example uh, and how soon this can happen? Thank you. 
I, I've heard that there's a number of countries, specifically in Latin America, that, that are watching it real closely. Um, for me, I'm, I'm not as much focused on what country it's going to be, but just that people have access to it and that there's people in different countries that are able to start using this freedom money. And so to me, it doesn't matter if they follow the same route as El Salvador um, and, and adopt it as truly a, a their, one of their currencies there, but just that there's openness and availability for people throughout the world to be able to use it and, and to escape the fiat system that a lot of times entraps them. I, I, I agree with Mike that uh, I've definitely heard chatter about other Central American countries, and to me it makes a lot of sense. Um, there's a shared visa zone there with Hon Honduras, Guatemala, Nicaragua, and all of these countries have dealt with U.S. imperialism uh, throughout, throughout the, the last many decades. Um, and all of a sudden, if two, two of these countries adopt Bitcoin and Lightning, and then three, and then all four of them, all of a sudden you have three, four central banks clearing between each other without any use of, of the dollar system, which is a tremendous geopolitical shift in my perspective. And so for, for many, many years in the Bitcoin community, we've talked about like, Oh man, what happens when when one country uh, adopts Bitcoin? Um, the, ga the the game theory changes, and surely, assuredly, uh, more and more to come. And so, I would keep my eyes on that on that region. I've seen some other bills floated out in other places, like Brazil, I believe, recently, somewhere in Europe. Um, but to me, this was the the signifier of like game on, and the world has changed uh, at this point. I think most people don't realize how unfair the current financial system is and how the U.S. really puts obligations and regulations on, on other countries that they don't put on Americans. So I have a business in, in the U.S. I do minimal KYC obligations. I transfer money back and forth without issue in El Salvador to get my car, like a long-term repair contract for my car for $400. I had to fill out AML, KYC, where am I getting this money from? I mean, that's a level of regulation that we don't put on Americans, yet we're pushing on the rest of the world, and it's really holding them back from developing. Just as we close this program, I wanted to bring something into focus. Uh, we've talked a lot about Bitcoin at the individual level, what you all have seen in the community in El Zante, and what people are doing all around the world. I mean, I agree with Miles and Mike that what has happened there is absolutely historic. And we'll be in, in whatever, whatever, if we have history books, I'm not sure. Well, I don't think, well, not, well, hopefully we still have books in, in 20, 30 years. But we'll be, like, has changed the course of, of history for sure. Um, but let's not forget, 99.9% .9 of Bitcoin users don't live in El Salvador. Uh, I mean, there are more Indian Bitcoiners who use Bitcoin than are Salvadorans that exist. So this is really this global phenomenon. We've tried to kind of show that to you through the, you know, the art in the back of the room and all the speakers. And this is not to be denied. I mean, this is a global revolution that's happening. And there might be good, there might be bad, but like we want this community to understand that, and that's why we brought everybody here. Um, it is surreal that we have made the like nation state adoption this fast. I mean, most people who use Bitcoin didn't think that it would happen in 2021. They might, they, they, they knew it was inevitable if they were believers, but they might have thought maybe 2025 or eight or something like that. So it's all happening a lot faster than, than I think we all thought. And you're gonna see other countries adopted in the coming years. And, that's just what's going to happen when you have kind of like harder money, like in the same way historically when like colonizers would go into countries, whether it be like Ghana or uh, what is now New England, or you had wampum or glass beads or something as currency, and they came in with gold and they just wiped everybody out. This is what's going to start to happen in some countries with Bitcoin over the coming decades, especially as we go into a, a global macro environment of governments printing just you know, unfathomable amounts of money and that becoming normalized. Like this is what you're seeing when you look at a Bitcoin price chart. You're really just seeing the if you flip it and you look at the dollar, you're, you're looking at the, the hyperinflationary collapse of fiat currencies against this new asset as it monetizes. This is important to think about as 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 we go into the next decade, and this is the start of something here that we're building at the Human Rights Foundation in terms of our desire to share this technology with you. Like we want you to be able to use it. We've gathered a whole bunch of people who want to volunteer their time and effort to help you understand how to use it and become first class citizens of it. We don't just want you to buy something on, sorry, Cash App's great, but we don't, we don't just want you to buy it. 
Definitely buy it on Cash App, but then move it into your own wallet. We want you to be your own bank. We want you to be self-custody. We want you to use Lightning Network. We want you to coin join. We want you to mine at home. We want, we want you to really be exploring all this stuff and, and take it up as a hobby, and it'll really be worth it. So look, I wanted to be grateful for all of you. And really, what, where it all comes down to is where we started yesterday morning with Fode. And you know, Miles hinted at this, but money's always been something that the powers that be control and has always been subjective. And I thought that Jimmy and, and Stefan did a good job of breaking this down. But essentially, like money has always been a political game. And there's always been a system where the money itself has some sort of subjectivity in it, right? And as soon as the tiniest little bit of subjectivity gets introduced into the money, the person with the most power and violence gets to control everybody else. And that might be the French in the case of West Africa. It might be the Chinese in the case of Burma. It might be the Americans in the case of you know, 1960s, 70s, and 80s in Central America. Like it, it, you know, in every part of world history, you've seen this. Now, for the first time ever, we have you know, money that is, that is really user controlled, and there is no you know, any sort of subjectivity. Uh, it is objective. There is you know, no discrimination possible. It does not care who you are, and that is to the people's advantage. So again, in the same way that I saw in the Oslo Freedom Forum in the, the decade from 2009 to 2019, nobody using encryption to everybody using stuff like Signal, that's what's going to happen with this technology in the coming decade. You know, when we gather here in 2031, there might not even be a Bitcoin track because everybody's going to just be using Bitcoin. Like, <laughs> I think we live in an well, interesting time when, like, there may not be Bitcoin conferences in, in tw you know, in the future because, what, do we go to, like, an email conference today? Like, I, I don't know. I don't, I, I don't know. But um, just what I wanted to conclude with is that uh, we, we want to reach out to the human rights community. The human rights community is sadly kind of overlooked money and finance uh, and kind of compartmentalized it as somewhere else in their, in their brain. And, and we get it, like that happened to me too. Like I was introduced by some Ukrainian activists to Bitcoin in 2013 and I didn't really pay attention to it for like four years, okay? So I was very skeptical and I know you're gonna be skeptical also, but hey, we're here to be advisors as you go on your journey because this thing's definitely changing the world. Um, we've heard a lot about you know, how the US government is going to mint the trillion dollar coin. <coughs> Bitcoin is trillion dollar freedom money. So, so that's kind of where we are today. So thanks again for coming. It was a huge pleasure to have both of you here to break down what's happening in El Salvador and this just incredible story of how this village in this country where people grew up as caretakers and never owned anything ended up changing the world's financial system is, is truly like beyond a Hollywood story. It's, it's incredible and it's only because of the hard work of uh, the people like Roman and the people like Jorge and the people like Mike and you know we're talking many many years of hard work that you know hey if Bitcoin collapsed tomorrow they would keep working with something else like it's really about the community they've built um, and <coughs> the cool part is that the Oslo Freedom Forum is filled with those communities we've got people here who are grassroots leaders who know hundreds of thousands of people in their countries so that's what gave me the you know confidence to do this is I know we I know we can replicate some of this stuff elsewhere because we have the, the more important thing. Like Bitcoin is a tool that we can use to achieve greater freedom, but you, you need the people to do it, right? And, and we have the people. So it's just a matter of connecting the dots. So thanks again for attending the Bitcoin Academy. We hope to see you in May in Norway. Everything here that you saw will be clipped and put on YouTube in the coming weeks. Um, thanks again to Miles. Thanks again to Mike. Thanks again to Aaron. We'll see you all later. Thank you very much. Thanks, Alex. <laughs>